The word Genesis means beginning. And chapter 1 tells us the beginning of everything. First there was nothing except God. At the end of the chapter there's everything. We all know the first verse. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes through day one, day two, day three, all the way up to day six. He's creating everything. Creatures, seas, mountains, stars. But he saves the best for last. On day six, he creates Adam and Eve. And that's our passage. Genesis chapter one, starting with verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. <coughs> Male and female, he created him. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. I give every green plant for food to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. I give them every green plant for food. And it was so. This is the word of God. Will you pray with me, please? Almighty God, you are worthy of all praise, for you have brought all things into existence out of nothing, in accordance with your will, and by the power of your word. You spoke, and the stars, the sun, the moon, the earth came to be. Formed Adam and Eve out of the dust of the earth and breathed into their nostrils the spirit of life. Indeed, Almighty God, all of us live and move and have our very being in you, the creator, the provider, the sustainer of all things. All of your creation displays your glory, your wisdom, and your power. Yet not even the mighty galaxies can begin to contain who you are, from everlasting to everlasting. You are the one true living God, the eternal, the holy, before whom we bow this morning. We bow and worship to you, Lord God, and pray that all of your creation, all creatures in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the seas, may they all worship and serve you now and forever. Amen. You just continue to pray right now that the Lord would send His Spirit to attend to the preaching of His Word. He would be lifted up. He has the words of life. Peter confessed that word very well. Where else can we go? Christ has the words of eternal life. So would you just pray right now that the Lord would send His Spirit to attend to the preaching and the receiving of the Word today, that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. Would you please just pray that aside from where you're at? sensitive to the things that creep into the church and how we are to defend against those things. To be the pillar and support of the truth. To be those who lift up Christ, to exalt Christ for your glory, Father, empowered by your Spirit each and every day. So, Father, please illumine your word before us. Open our hearts and our minds. And, Lord, please attend to what I'm about to say. 
Lord, with your spirit, that I might do it accurately, that I might do it to lift up, to edify, to strengthen all of those here, Father, that we would rightly understand our identity in Christ and all that you have for us, Father, in that identity, to proclaim the truths. So, Father, please, would you bless our time? Father, bless the preaching of your word, and may it be for the good of your people. So I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I love about talking about biblical manhood and womanhood is the covenant of marriage. Uh, some of you might be here, you might be single. Anybody here single? No, right. Anyway, was in the anyway, uh, What a beautiful gift. Singlehood. Singlehood is beautiful. You have a single focus upon Christ. You're married to Christ. Just want to get that out on the table first, right? Because we're going to talk in the next few weeks a lot about biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. And you're going to think why, but I'm going to explain that to you. We're going to get through some of this stuff. Um, really quickly, did everybody grab their notes before they walked in? Did everybody get the Danders statement? out there. If you didn't get it, would you raise your hand? And could I get like a couple of happy guys? Anybody happy for me? If they could pass those out. Anybody who didn't get it, raise your hand. Jim or look, everybody's raise your hand. Anyway, this is going to be a great outline for today and for the, the couple weeks to follow. Um, and I'm going to let John have a crescendo at the end of this. But back to our understanding of biblical manhood and womanhood. It started out with the covenant of marriage. Oh wait, back. Single people. Single people. You got a great benefit. You got a great benefit. So those of you who are married in the room, guess what? You took second best. Because the single people, they're married to Jesus, okay? So whether married or divorced or whatever, or widows in the room, if you're single, hey, guess what? You got it better. I had to take second. Second. Okay, sorry. You know, I'm in that relationship where it's like, okay, I'm not. Anyway, not true. Not true in that regard, but. But we need to have a little bit of whimsicalness to this. Because there's a serious apologetic that we need to present. Uh, the world creeps into the church. The world gets its, its, its entangles us. And we hear the things of the world sometimes in the communications that we say. That when we talk about headship in the church, we talk about male headship. Uh, immediately the response I get is, this is oppressive. This is man domineering and putting his thumb down on top of, of the women. It's like, no, no, this is a picture of Christ. This is Christ and his service to the church. Christ is the head of the church. The church is his body, is his bride. He cares for her, he loves her, he came to serve and not to be served. This is a picture of Christ and all of this. You need to understand that, first and foremost. This is about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it starts in the garden before sin enters the world. And what did, what did Satan, by the way, what did Satan attack? He attacked the very thing of the covenant. The biblical roles of manhood and womanhood is what he attacked. He usurped Adam's headship. He went to the woman, he got her to eat the fruit, Adam's standing right there, and we're in the condition we're in now because of it. He just re-wraps that all the time, so we need to be aware of that, and the culture around us, and how we separate from the culture, how we keep feminism and egalitarian feminism out of the church, and we understand what complementarianism is, and most of you are looking like you don't know what I'm saying. That's okay, we're going to take next week and just decipher that and delineate that, but for today I'll just give you a brief understanding of that today. But what did Christ do? He paid for his bride. Ephesians 5, we have a beautiful picture of what Christ does for the church. And how does this culminate? Think about this. It starts with the marriage covenant. Before sin enters the world, it starts with it. Christ redeems it. Where does it end? Turn with me really quickly. Turn with me to the end of the book. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19. How does this end? How do we come into the kingdom finally? In 19 verses 7 through 10, we read this to you. This is glorious. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That's how she's planned. Then he said to me, Right blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb at the end of this. That is a beautiful picture. That celebration. He calls his bride, the bride that he died for. He then we enter into that. What a beautiful picture. But in Genesis 26, it says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, 
Let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Equality, yet there's a diversity in roles. God created, them, created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. One creation of two parts, male and female. A beautiful equality in essence, but there will be a division of roles. He created Adam first, and then he created Eve. For what reason? What was the only bad thing in the garden? What was the only thing he said? It's not good. That Adam was alone. He needed a helper. We understand the word helper as a compliment. He wanted to come alongside. Not underneath, not over his head, not under his feet, but alongside, right? Where did the rib come from? Out of sight, right? How many of you guys like rib steak from the barbecue? Then there's another story. But she's to be along our side, not over our head, not under our feet. She's a compliment. That's what complementarianism is. Feminism says, no, we were created equal. We were created equal. So every role that any man can hold in the church or in the home or anywhere else, a woman could rightly hold that position to. Oops. No, she's supposed to be along the side. She's supposed to be along the side to help him in what he does. That's what a compliment, that's a brief understanding of complementarianism. But God created men equal in their essential dignity and human personhood, but different and complementary in function with male headship in the home and the believing community. That is the church being understood as part of God's created design. God's created design is that <coughs> male and female, one to help the other. So complementarianism is concerned not merely with behavioral rules of men and women, but also with the underlying nature of manhood and womanhood themselves. Biblical truth and clarity is the matter of importance, importance because error and confusion over sexual identity leads, for instance, to the following thing. Let me give a list there really quick. How many genders are there? Anybody want to give a guess? Was that? Two. Two? No, there's 36. And counting. Good laugh over there, right? So where do we divide from the culture? Where do we draw the line? We need to draw a line between the culture and the church. We need to see where does the culture enter into the church and where do we need to draw the line? And where do we need to be attentive to those things? Well, there's a clear and obvious one, right? There's only two genders, male and female. Yet the culture around us says there's, there's 36 of them or more, and they're adding to them day in and day out. Now, we can just say, forget that. We don't want to even hear that. We can also just say, this is the truth. This is the truth of God's Word. We say it in a kind, loving way. We say, no, God created you male. God created you female. He gave you purpose in that. He gave you identity in that. You're created in the image of God. Did you see what it said? We're created in the image and likeness of God. That's who we are. Everyone on the face of this planet who is a human, mankind, human, is created in the image of God. We all have the same identity. Yet some of us don't have faith in Christ, but God in the world. We have the same, same identity, created in the image of God. So some of the things we need to think about, marriage patterns that don't display the relationship between Christ and the church. What was Christ's position in this church? He was the head. She was the body, uh, the bride. The church is the bride of Christ. We need to rightly display that. It does not just display what we say. It's how we live our lives. It's how men and women relate to each other. It's how my marriage should reflect that. I am to reflect in my marriage the person who worked with Jesus Christ. My wife is to be a picture of that too, of the church. Take care for that. What about parenting? What about parenting? Does this affect my parenting? Yeah. Parenting practice that do not train boys to be masculine and girls to be feminine or to train their children at all. What's this idea of toxic masculinity? You guys heard about that? There's toxic masculinity in the culture these days. What are you talking about? Boys will be boys with like Gillette commercial. I mean, if you use the Gillette right here, I still do, but I probably shouldn't, right? They have this commercial now out that it says, boys will be boys. It's like, no, they shouldn't fight. They shouldn't do these things. My boys, they fought. And they were boys, and so they got spanked, right? Oh, wait, is that the guy's It's on video. That's right. I chastised my children. Well, I did. And they were the better for it or the worse, I'm not sure. But in Sweden, you know you can't discipline your kids? Sweden, you can't. Now, spanking went out, 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 out the window a long time ago, but in Sweden, you can't even discipline your children. 
You can't tell them they're doing something wrong. Okay, think about that for a second. Where is that coming to? Have you been to a college campus lately? Nobody can tell anybody that they're wrong. Remember, I, I joked about this at equipping hour. I had my coffee cup and I said, this is a stock of celery. I said, anybody can tell me I'm wrong? Everybody said, hey, you're wrong. I said, a cup of coffee. I said, no, not on a college campus today. I can pull up my cup of coffee and say, it's a stock of celery. And no one will tell me that I'm wrong. You, you laugh. I'm not kidding. I've seen the videos of guys on campus just trying to articulate right and wrong. It's gone. It is gone on a college campus. It's just insane. You can't tell people what's right and wrong anymore. And it stems, and I'm, I'm going to make the case, it stems from an understanding of the text we just read. Man and woman have created male and female. Number three, is a distortion of the biblical teaching on this matter leads to a course, of course, the increasing homosexualization of our society and the increasing attempts to justify these alliances and lifestyles. Because we don't identify ourselves as male and female anymore, homosexuality is rampant in our culture today. And they want us to endorse it. They want the society to endorse homosexuality. It's like, no, we will not endorse homosexuality because it's wrong. God says it's wrong. Number four, patterns of unbiblical female leadership in the church that reflect and promote confusion over the true meaning of manhood and womanhood. God's gift of complementary manhood and womanhood was exhilarating in the beginning, and it is precious beyond estimation. We should celebrate the differences. Do we celebrate the differences? I just had my 32nd wedding anniversary. We went up to the beach and looked down on the, the shore, and the guy we celebrated the fact that my wife was female and I'm a male. It was great, and we walked on the beach. I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> and it was wonderful. I loved it. But we were celebrating the fact that I'm male and she's female. Sometimes I'm a little too raw. I'm a little too much raw man, but we understand our identities in Christ, that she's female, I'm male, I lead, I protect, I watch over her. She compliments me. She gives me good advice. She's my number one counselor. And that should be said. I should not squash on her, on her advice. I should welcome her. So it should be precious beyond expectation. But today, it is esteemed lightly and it is vanishing. We believe that what is at stake in human sexuality is the very fabric of life as God wills it to be for the holiness of his people and for the saving mission to the world. That's what's at stake. Because in the beginning, God created us, male and female. And Satan interrupted that. And now we live with the consequences. So let me define complementarianism in another way. Think about it this way. Complementarianism believes that men and women are equal in the sense that they bear God's image equally. But it is further believed that this male-female equality as image bearers is not incompatible with male and female distinctions in design and roles. Thus, male headship in the family and in the church is not a contradiction to the fundamental equality. And by male headship, we simply mean that in the partnership of two spiritually equal human beings, man and woman, the man, the husband, bears the primary responsibility to lead the partnership in a God-glorifying direction. Can you get behind that statement? hope so, right? Our roles are for God glorifying, to be God glorifying. So the model of headship is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church who gave himself for us. This is a reflection of Christ. This is what we look to in Christ. He's the head of the church. He is that bridegroom that paid for his bride and will return for her, claim her, and enter into that marriage supper feast. This is about the gospel. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Oh, it's not that big a deal. No, it's huge. It's huge. So the model of that headship is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ as the head of the church. The antithesis of that kind and godly spiritual male headship actually goes in two different directions. So I'm going to take a lot of flack, and so is John. He gets the end of this. There's, there's two ends of the spectrum that we're going to receive a lot of harshness from. Think about this. On the one hand, uh, the self-centered domination of, of those who are husbands over their wives, who have this male domineering. We just discussed that, right? So the husbands that we're going to be rebuking that are dominant. I'm the man. Treat me as a lord, right? How many of you guys do that when you go home? Everybody, none of you do that. Don't do that, right? Or passivity on the other side, right? 
On the other hand, it might be the self-centered passivity on the part of the husband, refusing to take responsibility for those things that God has entrusted to him spiritually. So we got the other guy over here who just says, eh, not a big deal, honey, take care of it. On the other side. So I'm going to take shots from those guys. And over here, I'm going to take shots from the male dominant guys on the other side. Because neither one of those are acceptable, right? Neither one of those are acceptable. You're a picture of Christ, gentlemen. You're a picture of Christ, the church. You're to be a protector, a provider, a prophet, and a priest. And don't get worried, worried about those things. You're to protect your wife, right? You're to provide for her. You're to be a priest in regards that what do you do? You take a request to God. You're to be a prophet to her as you bring God's word to her. Four roles. We'll have a dinner. We'll have a banquet. You guys are going to get that at some time later. It's not on the calendar yet. John, we got to work on it. So we'll talk about men separately in those four categories. That's your role and responsibility. So we're going to get it from both sides. We need to walk the line in the middle. Male domination, we deny this. Affirmations and denials is what I want to talk about this morning. We deny male domination. We deny that males dominate over their wives. That's a bold assertion of man's will over a woman's will, heedless of her spiritual equality and her best interests and her values. Your women, the women in the church have values beyond compare. I was talking to an older man from this church who's now at home in Austin. Anyway, he said, the women, you need to get them on board. I said, absolutely, they're on board. They want to do lots of stuff. He goes, yeah, they'll want to do a lot of stuff. Get them involved. Get them in, in their encouraged. It's great to see that. They have, they have talent. They have ability. They can speak. My wife can preach, but she's not going to stand up here. Right? But she has the ability to do things that I can't do. Now I want to say very quickly that you will not understand complementarianism in the fact that you will completely misunderstand complementarianism in the distinction between male headship and male domination if you don't keep those in mind. Male headship and male domination are not the same thing. The egalitarian feminists say they are. So we'll separate from that. Male headship does not mean male domination. It does not mean that. But the egalitarian state, every time you talk about this, you're talking about patriarchal, Old Testament hierarchy. What did Jesus do with that issue? He did not put that aside. The disciples in the time of his ministry on earth said, hey, Moses said we could divorce a woman for anything we wanted to do. We could just write our certificate of divorce. He said, no, wrong. He said, that was because of the hardness of your heart. He corrected them on that. But he was in no way saying that there was this equality that the women would lead over that. The disciples were all men. They were men. He started basically correcting them on the fact that they had a hard heart. They had a male domination, but he didn't say that they would then be under the authority of, of their wives. He said there's a right way to do this. And where did he go back to to prove that? The text that was just read. He went back to the beginning. How were we created? We were created male and female in the image of God. That's where he goes back to. That's where Paul will go back to. So by feminism, I mean this. There's a couple different things because here's how it's crept into the church. What they now is now called evangelical. That's a tough word to keep evangelical separate from all things. Evangelical, egalitarianism, or feminism. By feminism, I mean secular feminism that basically views the Bible is incorrect on the issues and that Christianity and Judeo-Christian tradition is as a whole is inherently oppressive of women. That's feminism. Okay, so that's what we totally disagree with, I hope, right? But here's how it steps into the church. That's the dominant culture view, that, that Christianity is oppressive and wrong, and that the Bible is wrong about this, that's their view. The Bible is outmoded and incorrect, and this and the Bible needs to be rejected. In fact, it is claimed generally that even, or every ill in regards to man and woman in our society today is a result of Christianity or the Bible. People will say, for instance, that pornography is the result of Christian worldview. You, you laugh, but we're talking about intelligent people who say Christianity is pornography. Pornography is a result of Christian worldview. Now, there was a man who used to be in pornography. He got saved. This is very interesting, too. You guys can put this as a little thing in the back of your head. He got saved, and then in his testimony, he says, I was very wealthy putting pornography online. I knew how my audience worked. I knew how to target them. My audience was Christian men. Gentlemen, you're under attack. It's on the internet. This man was a millionaire. 
He knew how to target you online. He knew where you were going to look and he knew what to put on there to tempt you to look at pornography. And he said, I made a lot of money at it. I was good at it. He's very, very, very helpful to the church today because he says, men, watch out. Here's how it works. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving this man and showing the men of our church how devastating this can be and how much a target they are. So the statement I disagree with, but the emphasis of it, I agree with. Yeah. The men of this church, the men, the Christian men, are a target for pornography. It's destroying homes, families, lives. So basically, evangelical egalitarianism basically says this. No, 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 the Bible is true. Here's how it comes in. Sorry, I preempted that. No, 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 the Bible is true. Though sometimes the Bible is culturally bound. Oops. You guys know why that's a very scary thing to say? If the Bible is culturally bound, then we say, oh, it's this interpretation, it's that interpretation. Next week we'll, we'll talk about how we'll take the same verses and come up with different conclusions. That's next week. We don't have the we're near the time to throw that. Culturally bound or cultural relative. But if you really understand the Bible, evangelical feminism or egalitarianism says, if you really rightly interpret the Bible, you will see the Bible is egalitarian. That is that it makes no real distinction between men and women in the home and in the church. Anybody agree with that? That is, this is what the, the evangelical egalitarian would say, that is that it makes no role distinctions between men and women in the home and in the church. What is egalitarianism that is being taught by evangelicals today? Well, here's the formula. Men and women are equal in such a way that excludes male headship. And they quote the text that was just read. There was an equality there, wasn't it? They were all, they were both given authority to rule over the, the, the creation, right? I mean, it says it right there. And they go to that, they say, here it is. That is the essence of egalitarianism. Men and women are equal in such a way that excludes male headship. Men and women are equal in essence and roles, and there is no biblical basis for male headship or female submission in the home or in the church. I make the case that headship glorifies God the Father. From 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 5, we see that Christ is the head of every man, man is the head of every woman, and that God is the head of Christ. You know what you do, ladies, when you're submissive to your husband's even when he's a knucklehead? You glorify the Father. Stay under the umbrella that God has provided for you, even when he's running out in a hurricane. Because that's the umbrella that God gave you to glorify himself. It's the glory of God the Father. Think about that. It's a glorious, glorious thing that we get to do in the covenant of marriage. When women are submissive and men are submissive to Christ, it's a picture of the glory of God on display. You want to be a part of that? So we want to follow the Bible, right? It's not culturally bound. It's not archaic. It's not hierarchy. It's God's beautiful gift to us in the beautiful biblical understanding of man and womanhood for the glory of Christ. That's what we're about. That's what we're here for. Our life is to be that, to bring glory to God. So we follow His Word. And he speaks a lot about it. He speaks a lot about how we're supposed to be men and women. And this means two things practically for evangelical egalitarians. One, it means that in the church, spiritual gifts of men and women are to be recognized, developed, and used in serving and teaching ministries at all levels of involvement. Women are to serve as small group leaders, counselors, facilitators, administrators, ushers, communion servers, board members, deacons, elders, pastoral care, teaching, preaching, and worship leaders. And that is the fundamental contention of evangelical egalitarianism in the church. Women are to be able to serve in any office that a male can serve in the church. That is a very strong emphasis in their teaching. I hear some, I see some shooting in heaven. You know. Secondly, in the home. Oh, now I'm getting personal. In the home, they argue, there is to be no hierarchy or male headship. Husband and wife are always to make decisions jointly, and the husband is never to exercise any final authority in decisions. Everything is to be done consensually, through compromise, etc. 
Now, complementarians recognize that most of the decisions of the life actually work out that way. John, isn't that true? How much does your wife have influence over you? You're the head, she's the neck. You can turn your she wants. Is that not true? Anyone who says that that's not true, I wouldn't be you need to be in counsel. Okay? You need to just accept the truth, okay? The woman's the next, she turns the head into your voice she wants. But you're still the head. You still sign the, you still sign the checks, right? She writes them out, and you sign them. You need to accept the responsibility for everything that happens in your house. When God came looking for who did the bad thing in the garden, who did he go to? Adam, who messed up? Eve. Right? Didn't Eve mess up? Where did Satan get into this picture? Adam's standing right there. He didn't do his job. He let her talk to a sneaky car salesman, right? Sorry for your car salesman. I always say that. You gotta stop saying that. That's just not right. Use car salesman. Use car salesman. Still bad. Still bad. Still bad. Still bad. Uh, there's a beautiful, godly woman who said, you need to stop doing that in the whole bit. And she's a woman, and she counseled me, and I said, you're right, but for some reason I just can't keep my mouth shut. So, anyway, I'm a little bit raw now. Sorry. Uh, but who did God come looking for? Adam. Adam, who did he blame? Blame should started right in the garden, right? Said Eve, she did it. She gave me the fruit. And oh, by the way, you gave me the woman, God. Yeah. Wow. There's the blasphemy of the universe right there, right? Adam blamed God for giving me the woman. The celebration had ended. Because before he was singing praises to her. This is now bone of my bone. He was singing in the garden. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He should have you know, He's like, woo! -hoo! He was singing. He was singing poetry when he first got the woman. Now it all changed. She blames the snake, and everything goes bad from there. And what happened in the curse? Their roles were cursed. They weren't cursed personally, but the role of man and woman were what was cursed. God cursed the role because that was what was attacked by Satan. So we want to foster a biblical man and woman in the family and in the church. This is to build the marriages of our church. The reason we're going to this is not because we see it correctly, it's because we see that the world is invading. We're being attacked. And we're supposed to not be on the defense, we're supposed to be <coughs> offensive, right? We're supposed to be teaching what is right. We're supposed to be thwarting the, the evils of the world, not by defending ourselves, but by pronouncing the truth and building up and being strengthened. We're supposed to be on a holy jihad, right? Everybody okay with that part? I just got a lift from John. When Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, he took them to the gates that they understood were the gates of hell. He says, in my church, the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. He basically says, you, the church, are on the offensive against the gates of hell. We're supposed to be on the offensive. We're taking the sword of the spirit and do battle against the things of the world around us. So, why is this vital? Four reasons I want to give you for the vitality of this. It was vital because it never, it's never safe for Christians to act unbelievably or to ignore biblical teaching. So we need to understand what the biblical teaching is and not ignore it. Now I can preach all day up here, but if we don't do it, it doesn't really count for anything, does it? Are we just hearers of the word or are we doers of the word? So if you agree with what's said, you need to do it. If this is, finds truth in your hearts and minds, you need to follow it and obey it what we will be going over the next few weeks. So it's vital because when biblical men and women that are denied or altered or unpracticed, it results in disaster for families and marriages. Number three, it's important because the nature of biblical men and women is very much at the heart of our cultural transitions. The cultural war that we are going through right now are at the heart of biblical men and women. We'll work through that in the next week, two weeks. Number four, the denial or twisting of the biblical clear teaching on man and a womanhood is one of the central ways that the authority of the Bible is being undercut today. Now I'm making some pretty bold comments, aren't I? And I only have three minutes left. And I've got four pages of notes for next week. So we'll get to that. Because we're going to go through the hermeneutics of what egalitarians and complementarians say. We're going to find the same Bible verses that they'll take this way and promote what they say. And we'll say, no, that's not the teaching. So there's something we really need to be attuned to. Because you could sit here and I could be an egalitarian and I could fill your heads up and I could use the same scripture verses that I will say, no, it's about complementarianism. It's about what we see in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. 
That's what we need to receive. And it's about Christ. It's about the gospel. It's about who we are in Christ. Don't we, have, don't we struggle with that? Who am I? Don't you wake up in the morning going, who am I? Am I in Christ? What is my identity? That's what's going on in our culture. Why is Facebook and media going crazy all the time? People don't know who they are. Oh, I, I guess I was actually female. I need to get an operation and be changed. No. No, God created you the way you are. Maybe you like to cook. I'm not very feminine, so I have to work on that. I've had my man card taken away several times. Because I try to figure out what it means to be male and, you know, have a sensitivity towards female. And so my man card has been taken away from me. I don't know how many times. How many of you guys have man cards? Okay, well, I'm not too many times. But we need to have a sensitivity towards our wives, towards the women in the church. If you're not married, you're supposed to treat the women in the church like your sisters and protect them. Being false, gentlemen, we take the shots. Not the women. We protect the women. Right. So the Danver statement, if you take a look at that, I was going to read through the whole thing. I don't know if you'll have time for that. Turn to the affirmations really quickly. Let me just read through those. You see the rationale on this? I'd like you to take this home and read this. I, I was just going to tell you that you can get this offline, but guess what? I shepherd you guys. I know exactly what you'll do. You will not download this. So guess what? <laughs> hey, John, make comments. Okay? John, you messed up. Sorry. Anyway. There's the rationale on the front page. I want to go through the affirmations. We affirm what they affirm. Deny, we deny egalitarianism. We deny feminism, but we don't deny, or we don't endorse male dominance. We endorse biblical headship. We endorse in this church a picture of Christ in our marriages. The men are to serve their wives and to care for their wives. Now, I'm not talking if you're, if you're single, you're single. If you're married, you're divorced, that's the, that's the case. I just want to talk about the biblical manhood and womanhood, our identity in those areas. Your homes, I'm not interested in right now. So based on the understanding, look at our affirmations, based on the understanding of biblical teaching, we affirm the following. Both Adam and Eve were created in God's image, equal before God as persons, and distinct in their manhood and womanhood. That's from the text we just read. We agree with that. Number two. Distinctions in masculine and feminine roles are ordained by God as part of the created order and should find an echo in every heart. You should find this inside of you, speaking to you. I am a man. You are a woman. I'm not a woman, so. You should find this as your identity. You should be going, I am male, I am female. There's no question about that. There should be an echo in our hearts. Adam's headship in marriage was established by God before the fall and was not a result of sin. That's huge. The egalitarian feminists say, no, this whole issue of, of headship comes because of the fall. Look at the text. Headship is established before the fall, not as a result of it. That's what was attacked. It was right there. It was beautiful. It was perfect. God called it good. The headship, the issues there, what God established was before the fall. And he said it was very good. Very good. And we need to call it very good. Good. He called it very good. And then sin. So now we have a battle for that. That's where the battle is. Number four. The fall introduced distortions into the relationship between men and women. In the home, the husband's loving, humble headship. Gentlemen, let's highlight that. Loving, humble headship tends to be replaced by domination or passivity. The wife's intelligence, willing submission tends to be replaced by usurpation. Usurpation or servility. In the church, sin inclines men toward a worldly love of power or an addiction of spiritual responsibility and inclines women to resist limitations on their roles or to neglect the use of their gifts and appropriate ministries. We need to build women up, gentlemen, not lord over them. The Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, manifest the equally high value and dignity which God attaches to the roles of both men and women. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament also affirm the principle of male headship in the family and in the covenant community. Amen. Number six, redemption in Christ aims at removing the distortions introduced by the curse. In the family, husbands should forsake harsh and selfish leadership and grow in love and care for their wives. Wives should forsake resistance to their husband's authority and grow in willing, joyful submission to their husband's leadership. Gentlemen, lead your wives. Wash them with the water of the word. Care for them. See that they have what they need. Next bullet point. In the church, redemption in Christ gives men and women an equal share in the blessings of 
salvation. Nevertheless, some governing and teaching roles within the church are restricted to men. Number seven. In all of life, Christ is the supreme authority and guide for men and women so that no earthly submission, domestic, religious, or civil, ever implies a mandate to follow a human authority into sin. Ladies, you don't follow your husband into sin. Men, you don't follow your wife into sin. You draw the line. If the government calls us to sin, we say, no, this is against the word of God. We resist at that point. We do not follow anyone else into sin. We don't celebrate sin, and we don't follow anyone into sin. Number eight. In both men and women, our heartfelt sense of call to ministry should never be used to set aside biblical criteria for particular ministries. Rather, biblical teaching should remain the authority for testing our subjective discernment of God's will. The gifts of teaching and every gift that is there in 1 Corinthians 12 are given to men and women, but there's a limitation to where those roles are to be applied and how they're to be done. That's what that statement says. Look at number nine. With half the world's population outside the reach of indigenous evangelism, with countless other lost people in those societies that have heard the gospel, with the stresses of miseries, of sicknesses, malnutrition, homelessness, illiteracy, ignorance, aging, addiction, crime, incarceration, neurosis, and loneliness, no man or woman who feels a passion from God to make his grace known in word and deed need ever live without a fulfilling ministry of Christ and the good of this fallen world. That's the application of your gifts, whatever they may be. Number 10, we are convinced that a denial or neglect of these principles will lead to increasingly destructive consequences in our families, our churches, and our culture at large. I can agree with those things. I want you to take these home and think about them. But it seems as though every time I give an illustration, everybody focuses on the illustration. So I have one for you. I stole it from John Piper. But I know that, if, like, it's the end game thing, right? You guys are like, yeah, you didn't, you didn't even watch the movie. Yeah, I didn't. So it was a bad illustration. Here's a better illustration. Young man and young woman come into this church. They both sit in a quipping hour. It's a good quipping hour. They sit down next to each other. They listen, they watch. But they're, they're kind of not affiliated just yet. They're sitting in the quipping hour. Greg and John, they prepared a really good message. They're kind of checking each other out, right? And uh, they're saying, hey, they're taking notes. They're listening to the teaching. This is real good. So the break comes, right? 15 minutes before service. They're out in the foyer. They, they see each other. They, they engage in a conversation. You know, it's a friendly conversation. Uh, he initiates. He says, are you sitting with anyone? She's single, 26. This is, this is all good. This is 20, there are 26 and 28. Okay. How are we going to do it? We're just, it's all good. Everybody, okay. Well, the courtship people are going to do So they're engaging in the conversation. Hey, who are you sitting with? Well, nobody else sitting with you. So they sit. They do put a Bible in between them. <laughs> They're sitting, you know, so it's okay. Right? The Bible's with. And so they listen to the sermon, and John gave a really good sermon. I don't say anyway. And they're sitting there both dialoguing with the sermon. They're sitting there. After the service, he initiates another conversation. Hey, I'd love to take you out to lunch. I'd love to take you to lunch. Buy you lunch. Would you like to go to lunch? Yeah, maybe a couple phone calls. I'm going to cancel some stuff. Yeah, I'd like to go to lunch with you. Now, she has the, she has the problem. We'll say, no, your nose hair is a problem. This isn't going to work. Or she can say yes. Or she can say at a later time. But he initiates. And uh, she agrees. And says, I'm going to walk from here down to Old Town. They should have went the other way. Right? It's a safer direction from this church to go to Cafe Nooner and have lunch than to go down to Old Town. But they decide they're going to go for a longer walk and go down to Cafe Nooner. On the walk, they encounter a couple of thugs. Uh oh, I think it's a little bit disastrous here. Um, in the conversation, though, between here and about halfway down to Old Town, he finds out that she knows karate. She's a second degree black belt in karate, and she also competes. She can tear him up, okay? That's part of, the, part of the illustration. This is all made up, this isn't real, so don't worry. Okay? Anyway, so they get down, and the two folks come up, and they say, uh, hey, nice looking lady you got there. We'll take your per her purse and your wallet. And so they're getting ready to give them, and oh, by the way, she looks pretty good. We'll take her, too. The young man, does he step behind her and say, you know karate, take this off. <laughs> no, no. What he gently does is he, he takes her by the elbow and puts her behind her and says, over my dead body. He tackles these two men, tells her to run. He gets knocked out. EPD shows up in the crowd for him shortly thereafter. All three of the men are out conscious. Two of the men have all their teeth busted out. 
<laughs> you can imagine how that happened, right? She insists that he gets in the ambulance and she gets in with him to go to the hospital. On the way, she's thinking to herself, this is the man I want to marry. It wasn't about competency or ability. That's the point of Mike making it. It wasn't about the fact that she didn't have the ability to protect herself. You understand this? He did what he was supposed to do. Now, gentlemen, I'm sure as I've talked to young men about uh, marriage counseling, they're all, I'll throw myself in front of a bus for her. I love her. I'm like, will you protect her from Satan? The illustration is this. Will you protect her from false teaching? Will you protect her from yourself when you want to dominate over her? Will you protect her from the ills of the world? Will you wash her with the hearing of the water of the Lord? Will you do the things every day? I don't, I don't expect you to go out there and kill yourself or sell two thugs. I expect you to watch over her like Christ does the church and protects her. And you put her behind you. And you keep her away from those things that will do damage to her. That's what you're supposed to do, man. So the illustration, you'll remember that, won't you? Because you should be saying over to yourself, over my dead body. That's what it means to be a man. And she could have kicked their heels, but she said no. I'll step behind him. She could have just took off and whack, whack, whack. I'm sure she did. Snap. She steps behind him because she knows that that's her biblical role. Let's pray. Father, your word is for us. Lord, to teach us who we are in Christ. Lord, to help us to understand who we are as men and women. Lord, and how we are to close out the world around us. Lord, not to let them enter into the church, not to let the, the paradigms of the world influence our thinking and the, the teaching here at this church, Father, that we hold to the understanding that we are men and women created in the image of God to display Christ. Father, help us to understand that the gospel is at stake. Your word is at stake. We are to be the pillar in support of the truth. We are to fight against the culture and to know where those lines are. And to know how to do that. So, Father, give us the words to speak these things. Give us an understanding of the Christian life. What does it mean to live for Christ? To walk in a manner worthy of the calling of Christ. And to hold on to the truths that you've given us. Oh, Father, as we go through this in the next few weeks, please, illumine your word. You have the words of life. You have the words to lead a life that glorifies and exalts your Son. Oh, Lord, we long for the day when he returns to claim his bride. We long for the day to hear words, well done, good and faithful. Enter into the joy of your master, the great wedding feast that we look forward to. Father, please bless us with a clear understanding of that. As we leave today, don't let your words fall. Let them be upon our hearts and our minds that you would live a life worthy of the calling of Christ. Bless your people, Father, please. I ask in Jesus', in Jesus name. Amen.